And I'll start by saying welcome to this uh, special summer edition of Bach, Bagels and Bob, which is, you know, we have a concert of new music coming up and the orchestra is doing a lot of new music. And so that's why I decided to invite two, two of my good friends and colleagues, uh, Dave Williams and Michael DeMeo to come and talk about composing. And I thought it'd be also a good idea to have a musician who is has premiered some works uh, and especially premiered a year ago, a work of my own. And so I invited um, Emily James, who is a, a key member of the Baroque Orchestra and, um, and doing things, things with us. Um, I've been talking about Paris and recently gone to Paris. So I think what I'm gonna do and um, is I'm gonna start by playing a piece of my own. One of the things that was nice when I was in Paris was I was asked to compose a piece for a small string ensemble. And so I, I wrote this piece called Strings Along the Seine. Um, and I had never been on the Seine, so it was all in my imagination. I just imagined walking along the river. And uh, so I tried to come up with, and I, and I also listened to a, a, some, bunch, some French music. Um, I love some of the French composers I really like, or 20th century French composers like Ravel, Poulenc, Mio, and others. So I started listening and I thought, let me get a feel for what it might be like to depict musically walking along the river. Um, and then for contrast in the middle, I thought, well, what if you're walking along the river and suddenly a storm comes up and so it gets dark and, and stormy, but then the storm passes quickly and we're back walking along the river. So it's I, like Beethoven. Yes, yeah, like Beethoven, walking in the park. <laughs> so I would like to start by playing that, uh, a video from that performance from Paris.
beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah, really, it was a really nice experience. Um, I enjoyed everything. Um, it's, you know, a lot of my music comes from, uh, it's not exactly program music. I mean, but this was maybe the most programmatic of, of anything I've composed because I really wanted to just sort of capture that feeling. And um, my next goal is to actually make a little music video of it, take my photos of cruising along the sand and, and adding my, seeing if, if the music, music really fits. Um, I wasn't sure what order to talk to, uh, talk about to anybody, so I uh, kind of thought about it this morning, and I, I thought the, the newest member um, to introduce to the Baroque Orchestra family is Michael DeMeo, so I think um, I'd like to introduce Michael. Michael, why don't you tell us who you are first, then I'll play the excerpt uh, your, from, from your composition, and then tell us your approach to and ideas for, for contemporary music and, and making modern music. Hmm. So who are well, you? I, I'm sorry. Who are you? <laughs> who are I? Who am I? I live in Blairstown, New Jersey, and I'm from Bloomfield, which is in Essex County. And um, I went to William Patterson College along with Dave. We graduated the same year and then on to teach for 32 years in uh, the local high school here in Blairstown, the regional high school. And uh, went to graduate school at Montclair. And here I am. And that's, that's it. Yeah. Been retired 15 years already. I can't believe it. But it was a great career. Had a, had a good time. I enjoyed myself, you know, with, with, uh, with the kids. So anybody else a teacher? Yes, I think and probably everybody is. At oh, some Emily, you're a teacher? Absolutely yeah. not. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't have a video of Michael's, but he sent me a wonderful, really beautiful recording. And I kind of put a couple of uh, pictures of Michael in it so that we'd have something okay. to look at. Um, so let's listen to his music. And then, then Michael, you can tell us a little bit about um, your, uh, your approach to composing, uh, what you, uh, what styles, what, how you would approach, how you would associate yourself um, or what you would call yourself. Uh, just anything that you want to say about being a composer in, in the 21st century. So let me get started here. And we'll listen to a piece by Michael called A Warm Place. Um, this, Michael, this is actually an excerpt from some, uh, a movement from something else, correct? Yes, it's the third movement of a larger piece called At Birth. Okay. And this is the final part of it.
Very beautiful. Very beautiful. Thank Absolutely you. beautiful. Thank you. Michael. The uh, singer um, is a member of Bob's orchestra, Cassandra Lambros. Really? That was Cassandra? That was Cassandra, yeah. Uh, I met was... Cassandra, oh, I don't know, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago. And um, she ended up getting the lead in one of our shows in the city. Wow. She's a terrific talent. Yeah, you she know, is. She's, uh, not only is she's also a terrific violinist. It is indeed. You know, you know. Yes. So uh, she she played the lead in one of our shows, and then I asked her to do this, and she did it. Good, lovely. Sounds, sounds great. Sounds really great. Uh, thank you. So, yeah. Michael, tell us what inspires you to compose. What do you think about? Um, who are some of do you? Would you consider some of your influences? Um, what is it like to be a composer in, in, in the 21st century? What would you like to say about being a composer? Well, one thing you have to, one thing I think takes a long time to get over is to, as you're, as you're doing it, thinking, what will someone like? I wonder if they will like this, and I wonder if they will like that. And usually what it all boils down to is what you like. And that's really the only way to approach it. Um, because there's enough issues with, compo as you know, any musician, our biggest enemy is time. We have to, we have to deal with time and um, with music, trying to, because um, if, if you think about it, when somebody's listening to music, they're thinking about what they just heard, what they're hearing now, and what they may hear in the future. So... It's a challenge um, to, to juggle all that, I find. I don't know, my influences, I love to write for the theater. Ever since I was a kid, I always loved the theater. Um, I remember, I remember when my, my parents had, a, had the LP of the West Side Story original cast recording on a 33 disc. You know what they are, right, Emily? The records? Oh, okay, just, just checking. <laughs> You're young. But anyway, I used to listen to that thing constantly. And um, 
just just love Bernstein and uh, Frank Lesser. Um, of course, the operas of Mozart and my favorite opera, Tosca, Puccini's Tosca. Um, so just listen to that. And I try to kind of stay away from, I noticed Bob with your piece, you like tonality. I do. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah, yeah, most of the time. But for some reason, when I, when I've tried to get away from tonality, I, I don't know, I didn't feel like I was being honest or something. I just felt like it was kind of strained that I was doing it for the wrong reasons. So I just, I write what I like and uh, hopefully um, I, it comes from my heart. That's what I try to do. And that's what I do. Everybody understands if you're a composer, you just better off going back to the roots. And the originally it was, I started doing it for fun. So you go back and do it for fun. And then you don't think about anything else. You're just doing it for fun. And hopefully other people will like it. And I know Bob and, and Dave, you guys know the thrill of a, a performer liking um, one of your things. You know, it's a quick story, not to bore you, but the last show we did in New York was called Full Circle and it had a cast of nine and six. So it was about an, um, a mixed race couple, African-American and a, and a white girl and two sets of grandparents. And the one grandparent, um, his name was Gordon, a lovely man. And I, I was grappling on a song because his grandson, his young grandson comes and says, Grandpa, my, the, the kids at school are making fun of me because they call me licorice stick and they're making fun of the fact that I'm black. What should I do? I'd like to beat them up. And of course, the, the grandfather uh, says, well, no, that's not the way to do it. And then he explains in a song that love is really the answer. And I called the song Black Ain't Easy. And I was really uptight about putting this thing in the show. And uh, one day at rehearsal, Gordon, who was the grandfather, said to me, I'm gonna, he said, I'm working on that song and I'm gonna get it the way you want it. And so finally I, I figured, well, you know what, let me open up to him and tell him. And I said, Gordon, I was terrified. I said, I just didn't know how this would be received, you know, by a black man to have to sing it. And he ended up, he said he loved it. So that was really, really a thrill that, and he put his heart into it when he did that number. Um, so anyway, just a little story about, and I think that because it came from my heart and Gordon really sang it from his heart. And then we actually talked about it. It was just a beautiful thing. So anyway, that's my little story about Gordon and Black Ain't Easy. <laughs> that's a great story, Michael. Thank you. Um, and and, and I agree. There were, there's nothing, nothing feels so good is, I mean, first of all, the first thing is when an audience member comes up and says, I loved your piece, mm -hmm. that feels great. Mm -hmm. But when the musician says they loved playing your piece, that's, that's like, it, it doesn't get any better than that. It's such a great, great feeling. Absolutely. You're right. I totally agree. It doesn't get any better than that. So speaking of that, I'm going to next talk to Emily. And um, same thing, well, Emily will tell us who she is and what she does. Um, and uh, I'm going to play another piece, piece of mine. Uh, just a little bit. Emily works with a group called the Evergreen Violin Trio. And I was intrigued when she told me that because I thought, oh, I don't know that I've ever heard of a violin trio. I've heard of string trios and trios that are maybe two violins and a cello or violin, violin and cello. But I th said, thought, I wondered, I wonder what it would be like to compose for three violins. Um, you know, you don't have a bass instrument there. Mm -hmm. And it, it happened that when I found out about her group um, was two years ago and I ended up having heart surgery and I was in the hospital. And um, so I wrote this piece of three in three movements, which I just called a violin trio, but I wrote it while I was in the hospital. I wrote all the themes for the movements and I wanted to convey uh, not, not the experience uh, so much, but again, and if you remember two years ago, summer, July, 2020, that was not only was I going through this, but that was the, you know, the major time of the lockdown. So I wanted to convey the ideas. I mean, one of the things that struck me was that two days after surgery, of course, they had me sitting up, but I had my phone. And I thought, wow, how fortunate I am to be living today when I can be 
have major surgery and still do my work, still be in touch with people. So I wanted to convey that, that wonder of, of modern technology. Um, and then of course the other, the second movement is called Friends. Um, I wanted to convey that idea of, I thought about three friends and how just conversing and, and being together and the importance of, of staying together. And then the third movement I call Hope or Tomorrow um, because all the time that I was there, I kept thinking for myself, I'm gonna get better and there's gonna be a tomorrow. And I kept thinking COVID is gonna go away. We'll get through this together. We'll make it. And tomorrow we'll, we'll look back and say, see what we've done and what we've made. Um, and Emily and her trio just uh, were remarkable in how they interpreted, her, interpreted the piece. Um, and they did it, at, they premiered it at our uh, Orchestra Spring Festival. And then um, I was so gratified to hear them. They played it in a special concert down in Long Beach Island last summer, um, which was just an incredible, incredible performance and experience. So I'm gonna play the last movement, but before I play it, Emily, tell us who you are, then I'll play it and tell us what it's like from the musician's perspective to perform brand new music, to work with a composer, not necessarily working with me, but to, to be premiering a new piece um, and knowing that the composer is gonna be there, what that feels like. But first, tell us who you are and what you do. So my name is Emily James and it's great to see all of you here this morning. Um, first off, I finished my master's, my, my most current degree at NYU four years ago in 2018, and I went to school for musical theater writing. So I was working with composers and book writers and lyricists for two years. It was a very intensive program. Uh, currently, I teach um, general music and strings in a school in Dover, uh, the town of Dover. And I've also done some adjunct teaching at the college level with musical theater students. And of course, playing in, orchestra, in Bob's Orchestra, the Brook Orchestra of New Jersey. Um, I keep very busy listening to a lot of uh, music. I particularly love jazz. So I find that exploring music that's kind of in different vocabularies like jazz with harmonies and substitutions really enriches you as a classical musician and as a um, also as a composer. Um, and, um, <laughs> if you want to go to the listening portion and then I'll talk about what it's like to work with the composer. Okay. So this is the third movement of my, of my piece. Um, let me get it all set. Thank you. 
So, oh my God, it's gorgeous. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you, Emily, for, for all your work and, and helping. Those. So tell us, what is it like from a performer's perspective to play brand new music? Because um, you don't have any, you can't listen to anything, uh, any previous examples. It's all coming from, from you and, and, and such. So what, how do you approach it? What is it like? I, it's very exciting because again, it's something that hasn't been heard by anybody before and there aren't any recordings. So a lot of it is looking at what already is on the page and being com um, communicated by the composer and then finding out what the composer's intentions are first off. And then of course, going into individual practice where we all individually work on our own parts, but the biggest part of the work is what we do together and in the inter interpretation that we bring. So um, you mentioned that it is three violins and you would think that three violins would have a very treble, very high sound. Um, and the one thing that we specifically worked on with this piece was to bring in those lower, deeper tones so that it felt like it was a more well-rounded um, sound instead of just being in the higher, um, the higher pitch sounding, um, which I absolutely loved because as a string player, you're always trying to find ways of enriching the music and in and, um, deepening the tone and getting a, a very um, round tone, so to speak. Um, it also was really exciting, especially that last movement was so much fun to play. Um, when we first started working on it before we even had talked to you, Bob, I was like, it sounds like it's very like, like a machine that keeps coming back and keeps working. And it was, it, it, um, I was very excited to play it because it had that, um, that energy that was throughout the entire piece. So it was working on how can we best capture the energy through the entire, not just the entire movement, but the entire work, which is three movements. And, and then also in this last movement, it has quotes of the earlier parts of the trio. So how can we capture the energy, but also capture kind of a rem rem reminiscent of the earlier movements that we had previously played. And then, uh, and then it's the communication between the performers. So with, and particularly that last movement, there were sections where we were passing things to one another. Some of it was all layered on top, but the passing parts I think are really fun when you're performing in a smaller group because it's a, a communication with one another. And if you can communicate that as a performer, it makes the music much more alive for the audience so that they see the, almost like the dramatic appeal of the piece instead of just hearing what's being played. So it's also a visual um, that, that stimulates the audience as well. Um, I, when, when I approach a new piece of music, especially this trio, because you had also, we had not just the individual parts, but we had a score. Um, it's always going back to the score that the composer has sent and seeing what's going on in the score so that we don't lose touch with what is going on in the bigger picture. It's very easy as an instrumentalist when you're working on a solo section to get very involved in the solo section. And the main key is always having that perspective of working within a larger group, whether it's a string trio or whether it's an orchestral piece, always knowing how your part is part of the integral larger ensemble and ways to make it so that it's a communication amongst who you're working with. If you're working with a small trio, working with those three musicians, if you're working with an orchestra, the work that you do with the conductor, and also listening is a huge part of it. So it's listening to what things seem really important and the composer gives cues as to what those things that are important as far as dynamics that are marked in the music or tempo markings. But it's also in the balance of the ensemble, sometimes things have to be adjusted so that you can bring forth, oh, this is a really cool line. Maybe we should enhance this and listen to this more and bring this out more. So maybe the other two should play a little bit less so that we can really hear that line. Because in the end, when you're a performer performing a new piece of music, you're taking what the composer has heard in their head and has put on the paper and communicated with you. And then your job as the performer is to, um, is to really teach the audience how to listen to this new piece that the composer has written. So it's a huge responsibility, but it's also fabulous because you don't have any earlier examples of the piece of work to go back and listen to, which I think is really great because it's very fresh it's very open and it's a lot of exploration, which keeps you um, keeps you on your toes, but also makes it a lot of fun as the performer. All right, thank you, Emily. So 
beautifully stated and thank you for your kind words and thank you for your incredible interpretation. It's, that, it, Excuse me, just, so curious, just curious, Emily, what made you um, come up with a violin trio instead of the string trio? What, what was... That's a great question. Um, the three of us violinists, we had done some work together playing in other orchestras and um, in smaller ensembles. And the one violinist and I, I was like, well, we're getting together. Why don't we just play some violin duets? And then it kind of just come on, came on the scene. Oh, we have this other violinist. Why don't we try putting together some trios? So um, I had some music for violin quartets. <laughs> and violin trios and we're we just got together and sight read them and then it just kind of morphed into our trio from there on very good do you have do you have trouble finding repertoire for that or is it out there sometimes we do because the pieces that i had that were written for four violins in some instances we can reduce it for three violins so um we can take the two parts and divide it among two players Mm -hmm. um we have actually taken some string quartets for not like the, the top real difficult Beethoven string quartets or more of the classic but um, arrangements of things that have been written for string quartet and we have adapted them for the violin trio. Um, it is, I think it's more difficult to find repertoire for three violins because it's not as common. So as um, the arranger in the group and the composer, um, I would, we got together one time, I think a year ago, and I said, okay, what are some pieces that we would love to be able to play as a violin trio? And we just made an entire list in a Google Doc. And I was like, okay, um, when I have some extra time, and the pandemic was wonderful because I had so much extra time. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to knock out one after another after another. So we have a couple arrangements from pieces from the Great American Songbook. And um, I love jazz. And um, so I've tried to incorporate some jazz into our, <laughs> our repertoire and um, I, any type of jazz solo, I write it out for the other two so that they have it all written out. And, and then it's just a matter of um, interpretation and then making it feel like it's spontaneous instead of uh, preconceived ideas. Um, so that's kind of how it's just transitioned to what we have currently. Very good. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. that is good. And I've heard, I've heard your arrangements, Emily. You are terrific. Um, I enjoy your arrangements a great deal. They're, they're really, really terrific. Thank you. So, yeah, it's just terrific. So our third guest today, Dave Williams. Dave and I have known each other. Um, interestingly, wow. I, I knew Dave, what, maybe, I don't want to say how many years ago. <laughs> uh, let's say more than 40 years ago. <laughs> And then we lost touch and, and then uh, reconnected, I guess about eight or seven, six or seven years ago. So I've gotten to know Dave. Uh, Dave is a remarkable guitarist um, and teacher as well as a, a wonderful in depthful composer. Um, so I'm gonna play, a, 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 we premiered a piece by him called Octahedron a couple of years ago. So I'm gonna play part of it. I apologize, Dave, I can't play the whole thing. So it's 12 minutes long. There you go. So I, I, would, I try to keep the excerpts to you know three to five minutes. So we'll play part of it. So Dave, first tell us who you are, what you do, then I'll play your piece and you tell us about your approach to composing and sure. your influences and well, what you've well, learned about it. It's, it's my distinct pleasure to know you two fellows a long time. Um, like Bob said, I think we met in 1973 or four. Yeah, Long somewhere time. around there. <laughs> so like, I hesitate to say, but I can't believe that that's like 50 years. <laughs> It's amazing, amazing. Uh, but we had common interests. And at the same time, I've known Michael, uh, Bob, maybe two or three years longer. I met, uh, I met Michael in 71, maybe. And I used to, because I was a guitarist at William Patterson, I kind of hid out. So I'd hide in the stairwell and I'd bring my guitar and I'd practice there. And one day Michael's walking down the stairs in the stairwell of Marion Shea and we became friends ever since. And our educational um, experience has paralleled each other. We were William Patterson and then Montclair together, more or less. So, um, you know, it's amazing. Here we are 50 years later and we're talking. I think it's great. It is great. All right, well, let's listen to a little bit of your music, um, Octahedron. Let me get it started here. And uh, just other, as, yeah? it, interestingly, I mean, I didn't plan it this way, but um, 
you know, the, my trio is written for th an unusual combination of three violins. Dave's piece is written for a kind of unusual uh, combination of all cellos. I, I guess eight yeah. cellos since it's octahedron. Am I correct? Yep, and Evan's playing on this. Evan is on this one as well. That's true, Evan is. Thank you, Evan, again. Thank you. It's a, a real pl a privilege and a pleasure to play. Oh, thank you. Thank you.
Oh, I definitely want to hear this whole piece. That was beautiful. <laughs> Great, Dave. So good to hear you. Um, and, and to see you. So tell us your approach to composing. What influences you? What do you think about? What do you feel about being a composer in the 21st century? Um, who your influences might be? What What do you want to say about composing? Well, if I have, I don't know if I have influences, but I have models, mm -hmm. uh, people I admire. So maybe at the top of that list, and Mike knows this because we talk about it all the time when we go golfing, um, Charles Ives, uh, a Goretzky fan, uh, Satie, and maybe Ligeti. Those are the four composers I kind of yeah, I can hear that. look forward to. But uh, when it came to this piece, I, I, I think there's something about doing the canon and all that. I think I've, I've got to believe that maybe Goretzky was uh, an influence in this piece. And uh, generally, when I, write a, when I write a piece of music, I, I think Michael said it really well before, where it comes down to you got to write the music that you want to hear. Uh, and not really worry per se about what other people want to hear, because if you're true to yourself and you write something that you, you know, is part of you and it represents the message that you're feeling inside, uh, people will come around and people will say, you know, something I find value in that or I find a, I find an attraction to it. So um, I think every piece that I start off with, I, I have an idea, perhaps uh, a name, a title or even a shape of a piece. When it came to this piece, it was the overall arch of the canon. And uh, then that finishing up where everybody joins in, except for that last, uh, that last cello holding out the, the line while the other are playing the same pitch together. Um, that's kind of what I, you know, I do, either work off of a, a shape or I work off of a title. And that's where uh, I get my inspiration. Terrific. Thank you, Dave. It's just such a great pleasure. Um, I just want to tell everybody that on July 31st at the Madison Community Arts Center, um, the orchestra as part of the summer festival will be presenting new music by myself, by Michael, and by David. So if, if you're interested in hearing new stuff, um, please, please join us. Uh, then we also have a concert a week from tomorrow, next Sunday at the Madison Community Arts Center. Um, a lot of uh, Baroque music. We're gonna be playing pieces by Vivaldi, Bach, Handel, and, and yeah, that'd be pieces, nice. uh, uh, Joseph Haydn's Piano Concerto in D. And we have many other events. So please stay in touch, um, stay in touch on the, uh, check the website. Yeah. Oh, check yeah. Facebook, we will be making no, many. No, Madison Arts Center. Uh, Alan, somebody raised a hand. Uh, I do. I, I have a question that something that Emily said sparked my interest, where Emily, you were talking about playing a new piece and you're working separate and apart from the composer and you, your interpretation, you uh, collectively as your trio decide which line, which violin should take the lead in any particular portion of what you're playing. And I'm wondering, Bob, if ever they come back and present, play for you how they've interpreted it, where you see a whole different side of the piece that maybe was not in your head when you wrote it, but you may like their interpretation better or just different from what you envision. Well, I would have to say that, um, yes, uh, when I hear somebody uh, play my, my music usually, um, off or often, um, it does happen that I actually, I hear stuff. I think, wow, I didn't realize I wrote that in there. Or, and that was definitely true when Emily's group played played my piece. Um, I heard things uh, that that uh, actually sometimes what happens is I'll hear something in the, that they do, and that'll say, wow, I didn't realize I could have done that. I could have done more with that. And maybe I'll I'll take that into my next composition, um, or or build on it. Um, the way I compose, I like to, uh, I, I try to leave enough room for the, the performers to put themselves into it as well. Um, I, I do make the markings and I do have an overall idea of what I want, but um, I try to leave room and I would never, unless it was something really weird, which I, I don't anticipate, 
Um, I let them play. And if, if they, if they think this tempo is better or that tempo is better, or this balance is better, or maybe they have a feeling for how they want to phrase it. Um, I, I think that that's important that, um, you know, I, I don't want my music ever to get into a point where everybody who plays it sounds exactly the same as everybody else who plays it. I'd right. like, I'd like to think that it's my music, but it's Emily's interpretation or the, um, you know, the piece I wrote for, for Paris uh, has a viola solo in it. And I'd like to think that whatever violist plays that, um, they put themselves into it. Um, in fact, I originally wrote it without any viola solo. I was asked to put the viola solo in. So I did that at the last minute. And I thought, mm, I really like it this way. We actually played the piece without the viola solo <laughs> in it with the orchestra a couple of weeks ago. So it's, it exists in several different formats. But um, that particular violist who played it, uh, I liked some of the things he was doing that I hadn't anticipated. Um, so I'm thinking I'm going to write a piece for him uh, because I like what he brings to, to my music. Michael, or, well, Emily, how do you Thank feel you. about Thank you. How do you feel about your freedom as a performer uh, when playing a composer's work? So our freedom as a performer always works within what the composer has given us. So it kind of goes in line with what you just said, where we want to stay with the intentions, the overall intentions of the composer, and I guess the truth of the composition and how we interpret that is based on how we think the, like for balance, depending on the room or the space that we're in, we may have to make some adjustments so that um, it can come across in the way that we want it to come across. In terms of uh, phrasing, some, a lot of times the phrases are very clear, but sometimes, like for example, whoever's got the clear melody, sometimes within the other two parts that don't have the clear melody, there's something really interesting going on. And it's, um, it's a little bit, maybe not as strong as a counterpoint, but it's something that definitely is interesting to bring out. So we'll decide, even though the composer hasn't maybe necessarily said that this is something important that they want to have brought out as a performer, we may think um, this would be something that would make it a little bit more interesting while staying in line with the overall intentions of the composer. So there's quite a bit of freedom, but then again, it's always going back to what we've been given what's been communicated by the composer and it's basically staying within the intentions overall so that you are as a performer doing justice to the work that you've give your you've been given by the composer thank you so much yes thank you emily michael uh david um how do you feel have you ever like heard your own a piece that you you wrote and heard something different or heard something is, that made you think oh that's interesting or I don't want to ask you if you've ever heard anything and said, gee, I, I shouldn't have had them do that or, or, or something, but how do you, how, how are you, how do you respond? What do you think uh, when you hear your piece being played? Michael? Well, I, I always think the performer brings something to the, to the plate and something that we don't anticipate uh, in preparing for the upcoming concert at the end of the month, Allison uh, playing the pieces for me always brings insight into the piece that uh, I'm, I'm stunned. She does a wonderful job. So uh, good performers always do good things. So I could see why, uh, you know, you're pleased with what Emily brings. And I, I'm sure that Michael sees in performance doing his work. I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, Michael, what do you think? Well, I think the, without the performer, we're dead in the water. And <laughs> so, so it's very, very important. And it's, um, I've had great experiences with the way people have interpreted things. Uh, and sometimes you, you hear things that they do and you try not to, you try not to take credit for it, but, uh, it is terrific, you know, and uh, along those same lines, we can't forget the conductor in a, in a larger piece. Now we have a third person involved in the interpretation and that's huge too, you know? Yeah. So, but Emily is absolutely correct. Um, I totally agree. And the performer is paramount. That's the that's the end of the line of the um, whole composing experience from beginning to end. I agree completely. Well, I, I see we've we've run over our hour. I want to thank everybody for being with me this morning with us. 
especially thank our, our wonderful, wonderful guests, Emily James, Michael DeMeo, and David Williams. I hope you'll join us. Um, we have several concerts coming up, several events and uh, new music events, uh, Baroque music events, a symposium, uh, all kinds of exciting things. So I hope you'll join us uh, and stay with us. Meantime, have a terrific, wonderful summer. Um, stay well, stay cool, and keep listening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thanks, Bob. Thank you Bye, Bob. everybody. Thank you.